All right, welcome back to the Morning Update Show. My name is Omari Salisbury. So in studio right now, we got, man, I'll, I'll, I'll let you briefly explain everything you do because you can probably explain it <laughs> shorter than I can. But, man, we got Willard Jimerson in here this morning. He's going to talk to us about what's going on um, as far as the, the prison community and COVID, the state's response and the prisoner's response. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Salisbury. Um, yeah, my name is Will Jimerson. Um, I'm currently in the role as a community facilitator working with ZYD, Zero Youth Detention. I'm just also just somebody that represents the people in the streets. And so in, in every aspect, in every capacity, whether that's in the community, whether that's folks who have been pushed out of community through various systems. So um, just standing up to be an advocate for them as, as many ways, many folks have been advocates for me as well. All right, fantastic. So if you can tell us, like I said, a lot of, it didn't make breaking news a lot of places, but you know, I mean, at one point the Washington State Patrol and other agencies responded to the, to the uh, I guess it's MCC, to the prison basically, as most people know, the prison in Monroe, where they said that like 100 inmates were, I don't know what the proper word might be, protest, might be riot, might be mm -hmm. incident. But I know that you have a lot of insight. I know that the, the prisoners in Monroe and other facilities reach out to you for guidance and mentorship. Maybe you can kind of tell us briefly what did occur up in Monroe and why. Um, what occurred up at the Monroe Correctional Complex, just so people can under, have an understanding, is not just in one particular facility. Monroe has several different facilities and several different security levels, and none of them interact with each other. So for them to be in unison uh, all, across all security levels and all, across all uh, um, facilities with that MCC, um, let you know um, how how tremendous and how impactful uh, the circumstances around COVID-19 and the lack of uh, having security safeguard masks or gloves or, you know, uh, to adhere to the, the rule of social distancing has not been occurring at Monroe and other different facilities such as Cedar Creek and also at uh, WCC, which is Washington Correction Center. I know there's been some issues at Washington Correction Center for women as well, but uh, those things are not taking place, even though this is what we have been ordered to do. This has been shown right now, even in uh, our, our research that's been published today through Morbidity and uh, Mortality Weekly Report has been shown that Seattle is one of four U.S. cities that is being uh, watched in terms of creating a template across the nation, and if not around the globe, and, and they know that through the, the uh, social distancing orders and other different things that have been in play has helped to decrease, and if we can't have the population that has jumped on top of each other is, is in a sense packed like sardines, uh, 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 adhere to these same social distancing orders where we're going to see an increase or an influx of uh, COVID-19 cases. Right. Now, what the governor said was that they wanted to move the inmates. My understanding is they wanted to move some inmates around over there and that the inmates didn't want to be moved. And he said that it was kind of like a click thing. He called it a social network. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? He said that the social network inside the prison, the prisoners didn't want to be moved prison the, the 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 prison wants to move the prisoners but they only want to do it if the prisoners are going to cooperate because they don't want violence to occur like it was really weird when the when the word violence popped up mm -hmm. because you know I'm listening 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 is there a threat of violence in there in well, Monroe with, with the prisoners and the, the, the COs, correctional officers? It's, a, it's an easy tagline. You know, look at the circumstances in the population that we're referring to. So to use a, the terminology violence or something like that, it's an easy tagline. We can hang up a lot of different aspects of how people move when we use public policy or public safety in that, in that regard. And to be honest with you, the response that you've seen at MCC, at a Monroe Correctional Complex, in, in terms of, of a resistance, that was, the la that was the last response that anyone wanted to come to. Most of the men in there have been reaching out, even to me, right? And they just want their voice to be heard because they are not being protected. Not only those who are incarcerated, but also those who work. There's been confirmed cases from staff members who have COVID-19, and there's no aspect of safety shields, safety guards, even though these men on the inside are, are, are creating and working and making 
making the PPE, which is the the, um, the, the mask that you use to protect yourself. Yeah. They're making the, the surgical, they're making the surgical gowns. They're, they're doing things in order to be concerned of other folks' humanity, but other folks are not doing things to be concerned for their humanity. And if they're not concerned for their humanity, if somebody in there catches, and which there have been confirmed cases of COVID-19, and they're working to make these surgical gowns and these surgical masks, and they cough or uh, uh, place anything that might be on these surgical gowns, and they have not been screened themselves, then that then that means there's a possibility of transmitting COVID-19 even I back into the community. Also, one of the things that didn't make it in that clip is this thing brought up the fact that prisoners move around the system. Yes. They're, they're, you know, I mean, some a prisoner might not necessarily be in the same prison, that, you know, they're, they're, the stint of their time. Yeah. Individuals move, move right. all throughout the right. various aspects right. of different institutions and security levels in the state of Washington. Right, right. And so... Uh, I mean, the thing is, the flip side of this, right, it was like, man, why should people care? I mean, and I, and I say that in, I mean, a lot of people, our viewership, it's a lot of people from the Central District, the South End, you know what I'm saying, high, high disproportionately have been impacted by crime and violent crime, highly impacted by, you know, the impacts of the end result of, of, of crack cocaine, the end results of heroin, the end results of pills, what a lot of people are locked up for. Why should somebody watching this show care if the people in Monroe or Walla Walla or anywhere else don't have proper distancing or don't have, you know, hand sanitizer or whatever? They're in prison. Why should someone care? They should care for all the same reasons we've been asked to care to create social distancing orders, to keep people safe, to keep people alive. So individuals will not end up with a death sentence just because you are simply communicating with each other. These are the reasons why you should care. I understand this is a different population because it's a population that currently is not in society, but they are a part of society. They're your brothers, they're your sisters, they're your nieces, they're your daughters, their people are coming back into the community. About 98% of those who are incarcerated will return to society. So we want to make sure that they return healthy individuals that can make a contribution back to society. If they return in, return in sick, there's an opportunity for us to get sick. And the, re, and the reality is the population that we're talking about, like Cedar Creek, they're already in the community. What do I mean by that? They work Monday through Friday. Where are they through, working at? They work all throughout the state of Washington. So outside Majority, of the jail? Outside of, they, they go, they're at a camp. So they're at a minimum security level, which allows them to come back into society and work at places like the University of Washington. They might be working on your, on your, on your highways. They could be working in different institutions, facilities, hospitals, wherever there may be work that is contracted with the Department of Corrections due to correctional industries. They show up in various so, aspects. This, might, this is probably a whole other conversation, but yes. it sounds like what you're saying is that other other state agencies contract with the Department of Corrections yes. for laborers because you yes. mentioned hospitals, you mentioned universities, yes. you mentioned highways. So instead of yes. maybe hiring other people, they're literally hiring prison labor. Yes, and and just to be honest with you, it's one thing to study the subject, as my brother uh, 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 Kimani would say, Kimani Carter, but it's another thing to be the subject. So you get a different nuance or different in, in, inside understanding when you've been there. And, and for some, for, for people who don't uh, know, you used to be the subject. Yeah, just you, to give reference, I used to be the I used to be the subject, right? I was I was that individual who went in at the age of 13, and I did 20 and a half years straight. That means I I didn't have a reprieve or or, or a break from my from incarceration from 1994 until 2014 from 13 to 33 so I can give you the insights I can give you the specifics that most people cannot speak on in terms of being a, a true pundit around this particular topic so the reality is I was one of those individuals who was at Cedar Creek who worked at correctional industries and I worked at the University of Washington I came and furnished the University of Washington when they put up the new buildings we went around the state capitol and, and, and so furnished those the, the places thing as well is another reason why COVID tests is important is because people who are in the prison system leave the prison every day. Leave the, they leave the system every day. Not only, the, not only those who work in the system, from administrators to guards who come in contact with this population, because there's some people could say, well, every prison doesn't have that particular security level. You're absolutely correct. But every person comes in and comes out every single day in some particular well, capacity. We, we've got to get out of here shortly, but I, I have one more question for you. The governor there, the, uh, the original question that was posed to the, to the governor and to the, uh, the secretary for, for prisons or for corrections said that are prisoners being tested for COVID 
before release. Some people have mandatory release date, you know, their, their, their plan is in place and everything else. Now, when the governor answered the question, he said, screened. The, the, the reporter asked the question, are people being tested? Mm -hmm. And the governor um, and uh, the, the secretary there for, for corrections said, screened. Is there a difference between tested and screened? And are people getting out of the correctional facilities in the state of Washington with only a screening of their temperature and not an actual COVID-19 test? Well, you're absolutely correct. There's a difference between the verbiage, between being screened and being tested. The information that I've been receiving from individuals who are at WCC, which is Washington Correction Center, in Shelton, Washington, those who are at M MCC, Monroe Correctional Complex, um, and also at Cedar Creek, there have not been any screening or testing unless there is a, 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 a aspect of concern of somebody who may have COVID-19. Then, they, and, and you already know testing uh, kits are very limited. So to say that they have a pop up, a, 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 a testing kits available for this population let's just be honest i don't think that's taking place from the feedback that i'm receiving what i've received was there's in there's still chains when we say chains that means there's bus that comes to different institutions on a weekly basis they come in from shelton they come in from different parts of the state of washington into various institutions they are not being screened and how I know this is individuals have told me there's people getting off with coughs and they're sick and they have not been screened, uh, such as at Cedar Creek, and they've been concerned. Well, the, the thing is, is that we find that COVID can be transmitted, it's uh, asymptomatic, can be transmitted basically by breathing. Correct. So, um, I mean, releasing somebody, even if they're not showing symptoms, um, you know, considering how vulnerable that population is to, to be able for, for COVID to run rampant. Correct. Um, it seems like it might be prudent. Before we get out of here, mm -hmm. what exactly is it, if you could tell us briefly, what you want the state of Washington to do in regards mm -hmm. to this issue of COVID in the prisons? And then also, how could people reach you if someone wanted to reach out? Okay. Absolutely. I just want to sum I just want to uh, summarize a little bit about the reason why I brought up the fact that individuals are not being screened on the inside, moving from one institution to the next. It doesn't make sense, once again, why you hear the individuals who are on the inside saying, we don't want to be moved because that's not addressing the issue because people are being moved already. They're being they're in various aspects and they're still not being screened. And I know individuals who are at work release right now, right here in Seattle at, at Reynolds work release, they're not being screened and they work and people in work release work in the community, right? And they're all throughout the community. Um, and, and what we're asking for, we're asking for alignment, right? In, in, in a strategic development in addressing these issues that are in the Department of Corrections. It's, it's very difficult to be able to do the work and the population that you're trying to answer certain questions for is not at the table. Um, the reason why I say this, because in response to the, to the peaceful demonstration that, take, that had taken place just a few days ago at Cedar Creek, the response was over the, over the intercom, not sitting face to face or dialoguing with that population, they said it, in, 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 in respects to try to uh, promote social distancing, we're going to go ahead and release those who have 60 days or less. And so there's about 124 plus men who are on one tier. And, uh, um, and then and the, the individuals there told me, they asked the, the men who here qualifies, who has 60 days or less. No one raised their hand. Because when you're at a camp, you have to have four years or less to be in that population. And no one raised their hand. So essentially, they could have just asked the question, if you're green or if you're purple, we'll release you, right? And the reality is it doesn't, it doesn't address the, the situation if you're not pulling that population into the table. So when we're talking about really addressing these situations, these circumstances, it shouldn't be about them without them. So you need to have everybody at the table come up with a strategic development plan. This is what we're asking about. We're asking strengthening the alignment component because you can't make a decision for a population if the population is not there to help inform that decision. It's just like me and you as men saying, guess what? We're going to come up with some gender adequate laws around women, and we're going to ostracize women even being in the room. But as, us as men, we're going to come up with what that looks like. It doesn't make any sense. It's like Capitol Hill every day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, how, yeah. How can people um, um, get up with you? You know, I mean, especially people who might have uh, relatives, family members that are um, inside the correctional facilities right now. 
Um, you can hit me at um, my email address is uh, wjemersonjr at unitedbetterthinking.org. Or you can hit me up at um, my, even my King County address is wijemerson at kingcounty.gov. Uh, and my phone number as far as uh, work is related is, is 425-902-7755. If you guys are serious about reaching out, making a connection, we can make it happen. But just know that I'm, 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 I'm working in, 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 in contact with many others so the reality is my, 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 my phone is always buzzing uh, and things of that nature but you can contact me text messaging is probably the best because that way I can I can work on multiple aspects and communicate at, at multiple times yeah, and you know the best thing is, is I no longer need an alarm clock because every morning at like 4 30 a.m. I get a text <laughs> from this guy saying man the world is great <laughs> yeah, Willard Jimerson yeah. uh, inspirational will you know what I'm saying? I know we don't always see eye to eye on these issues, but man, you know, one thing for sure is, man, we always want to stand on the side of what's fair. You know, my mama always says there's a difference between justice and what's just. Absolutely. So let's figure it out. Uh, thanks again for coming out. We're going to take a short break right now. When we come back, we have Trayana returning to the set. And we also got our super producer, Akeja Ayana. You are watching the Morning Update show right here on the Africatown Media Network.